Thank you very much uh, for this friendly welcome. Uh, it's an honor to, for me to be here today at such a well-known and uh, uh, famous institute. It's a pleasure for me to be here, in particular at a good moment in time, as Liam said. Uh, I couldn't come last year, I think. I was invited already last year, couldn't make it, and then we scheduled uh, today's event uh, at least six months ago, if not earlier. So we were right on target. Uh, so our expectation that November would be a good moment in time is true. So what I would like to, to uh, tell you a little bit about is uh, what we are doing now with regard to infrastructure in Brussels. Um, we will present next week uh, what we call a package, an infrastructure package, which is really in a communication, uh, an outline on how we see infrastructure policy, energy infrastructure policy should be developed. But before going there, I think I should give you a little bit the context. Um, um, we are now working under, in an environment where we have, for the first time since the Lisbon Treaty came into force, uh, a treaty on en uh, an article in the Treaty on Energy, uh, which um, says that we should uh, look at the functioning of the internal market, that we should secure uh, energy supply, that we should promote energy efficiency and develop renewable energies, and also that we should promote the interconnection of energy networks. So this is a, a legal requirement at the highest European level. Uh, based on that, we had uh, developed since 2007 uh, a number of, uh, of uh, documents which... Uh, uh, where we have tried to bring energy on the map, back on the political map again, and I think we have succeeded in so far as today you have hardly a meeting uh, where energy is not on the agenda at the highest political level even. We have started in 2007 with the first strategic energy review. You may recall that we tried to make the link between global climate change and energy policy. Uh, this has been followed up then by a number of initiatives, in particular the third energy package, uh, where we wanted to uh, complete the internal market. I will say a little bit about this also. Uh, we have um, proposed last year a regulation on gas security of supply, which Council and Parliament adopted in record time of 12 months, which obliges member states now to uh, do a risk analysis on their gas supply situation and also have uh, crisis plans, emergency planning. I'm convinced that if this uh, regulation would have been in force already in January 2008, it wouldn't have any impact of the cutting of the gas through, through, through the Ukraine, uh, because member states would have been prepared for such a shortfall. I've established in particular in the gas side, the, what you know from the electricity side in a different format, the N-1, meaning that the member states must be prepared for the, short, for the shortfall of uh, a major gas infrastructure and be ready to find additional sources uh, for this gas. Uh, we have made, uh, of course, in the, in, also in other sectors like renewables, we have a binding renewables targets of 20% overall uh, by 2020. We have an energy efficiency action plan where we think a lot needs to be done still. Uh, we will, Commissioner Oettinger will come out in February next year with a new energy efficiency plan because of the three 2020 targets which we established in 2007. Actually, energy efficiency is the one which, lay, which when, when most needs to be done and where the most low-hanging fruits are available. But it's a grassroots issue. It cannot be uh, imposed uh, top-down by Brussels, but a lot must come there uh, in the building sector or in small and medium-sized companies and so on. So we are now, um, we are now uh, in f faced with a new, uh, in, in updating what we have done over the last four or five years. And Commissioner Oettinger uh, wanted this week, has presented this week, the outline for the energy policy uh, under his mandate, uh, but beyond also till 2020. And he has outlined five priorities. Uh, this is not revolutionary new, I would say. It's uh, the priorities which we all know, energy efficiency, uh, integrated energy market, energy technology, protecting consumers and safety and security, and the external dimension. But what is important is, I think, is the, is the emphasis Commissioner Oettinger has put this week on a number of the issues, and one in particular uh, related to the topic of today, <coughs> that he thinks we need to increase our efforts considerably to, to, in the energy investment area to be prepared for the changes. He has outlined that uh, EU-wide we need, until 2020, about 1,000 uh, uh, 
1,000 billion euros in investment, about half of it in electricity and uh, production and, and in supply, uh, about uh, four, up to 400 million in distribution networks and 200 billion in, in transmission networks. So there is a huge challenge which needs to be done, and this is exactly the basis uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the upcoming infrastructure package. Actually, he always talks about two pillars uh, which are important. One is the completion of the internal market, and I would not want to start talking about infrastructure before we talk about the internal market. Uh, we think that uh, uh, we, we need to see that we get uh, uh, gas and electricity crossing the borders much more freely and much more uh, much more, and without any barriers. We see today that the markets are still quite quite uh, separated, segregated from each other. And um, uh, it's not very good news if, for example, one big European electricity, electricity and gas company, E.ON, announced a revision of its company strategy away from Europe, uh, uh, where they say they will try to divest uh, in uh, assets which are not essential to their business portfolio and will look uh, outside the European Union for additional investment. I think this is a bad sign. E.ON was one who, who, who put a lot of emphasis on the development of the European market, and if now the new boss of E.ON thinks that this strategy needs to be revised, it doesn't shed a very positive light on the, and shows that a lot needs to be done still in accomplishing the internal market. Uh, we think that the third uh, energy market package, which the member states need to transpose into their national law by next March, is the basis, is the basic framework for the internal market. Uh, we have uh, strengthened in particular also uh, the, the independence of the national regulators. We think that uh, energy markets need to be free, but they need also to be controlled by strong energy regulators. Uh, we have, for the first time uh, it ever happened in the European Union for an economic sector, uh, uh, put through and ex have, have had this accepted by Council and Parliament that the regulators are, um, are completely independent not only from the companies but also from, uh, from the minister so that the minister cannot give orders to the energy regulator how to decide in an individual case. He can give guidelines but not, cannot influence the decision in an individual case. Uh, we have, as you know, effective rules on unbundling. Uh, the Commission wanted to have clear-cut ownership unbundling. We have now a compromise where uh, the dominant mother company can still keep uh, uh, the ownership of the transmission assets, but uh, needs to manage it at arm's length, uh, either by an independent system operator or with, uh, within a, a solution where um, <laughs> there are safeguards and controls uh, to guarantee that the transmission networks are independently managed. And the last point which I wanted to make, we will see over the next three and four years a lot of efforts to develop really the technical codes uh, to allow gas and uh, electricity to flow freely across the borders within the EU. Uh, I, there are a number, there are about a dozen different codes which uh, need to be harmonized. They exist at national level, but we need to have a common basis at the European level. Uh, on capacity allocation, uh, capacity uh, congestion management, balancing, tarification, and so on. Uh, and there we have established uh, a, a bottom-up approach where this is uh, developed. The, the priorities are set by us, by the Commission, and then those codes are mainly developed by, by NSOE and by NSOC for electricity and gas uh, in, an, in, an, in an interface with the regulators where we have a newly established agency which will also be operational next March in, in Ljubljana. Uh, and we will hopefully, and our objective is that by 2015 we have this internal market accomplished. That is the big objective which I, I hope uh, will also be confirmed uh, when the heads of state in next February will discuss uh, this energy strategy. Uh, which I have just uh, briefly outlined. It's, uh, it shows that it, how important energy has become that for the first time the heads of state of the European Union will dedicate a whole day exclusively to energy topics on the 4th of February next year. So that is the framework now uh, when we look at infrastructure policy. Of course, you can talk a lot about internal market, but if uh, the interconnectors are congested, you don't have much of an internal market. So what we see is that we need a lot of investment uh, in, in, the internal, in, 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 in the interconnectors, both in gas and electricity. 
um, uh, we, we have already had um, a very positive response by the European Council who asked to develop such a, a revised uh, infrastructure policy. Uh, this has been repeated only last June 2010, so we, I think we are completely in line with what the ministers have requested from us to do. How do we want to approach that? Now, this package, this communication, which is a communication, more a discussion paper, if you wish, as, a, as an input to the discussions in the, uh, for the energy ministers in December and for the heads of state in February. Uh, it's not a legal proposal yet. So that will come next year. Um, so what, uh, what, do we want to, what do we want to say here? Uh, we see that uh, uh, we need a vision at the European level. What are the infrastructure priorities for investment? Uh, we think that the existing trans-European network program for energy provides this vision only in a very imperfect way. Um, what, uh, what kind of legal incentive do we need to deliver that? Uh, do we need um, to have a new method of strategic planning uh, to agree these EU priorities? Uh, and then we need a toolbox, uh, I think, to make it happen. We need uh, regional coordination. We have some regional initiatives, seven in electricity, three in gas. So we try to create in a, in a, in a regional level already this internal market. Um, where we hope that these initiatives can also play an important role in infrastructure planning. We need to look at uh, how the decisions are being taken. We need to look at permitting. I will come to that. And, of course, also at financing. That community approach goes in parallel to an approach by, and should be totally compatible with what Constantine will tell you later on, namely that the transmission system operators themselves will develop what they are required to do under the third package, a 10-year network <coughs> development plan. So there should be a mutual interface uh, between what we develop as, as political strategy guidelines and the, and the uh, more bottom-up approach by the ENSOs, which also needs to take into account energy security. Um, we have a number of uh, challenges and uh, drivers for this development. Uh, of course, the existing trans-European network program concentrates on electricity and gas. Uh, this will still be the big important issues also for a future investment instrument at the European level. Uh, we see that electricity will have a high increase over the next years. We will see a, quite an important increase in renewable energy. Um, we see that we need uh, also to develop smart grids, uh, one very important topic for the future, to have bidirectional uh, steering also through a smart grid. And we need also beyond 2020, I think, uh, new lines, high voltage lines uh, for long distance transmission, in particular to link the wind in the north or the solar from south, possibly from Africa, uh, to the consumption centers. Now I leave it to Constantine to tell you whether this should be AC or DC lines. Uh, there's a lot of technological development, um, but um, uh, we will see what, what happens there. For gas, uh, I think gas will remain a very important backup fuel for renewables. Even renewables will increase. There will be an important room for, for gas. Um, we need to diversify our imports. We have today three main corridors from Russia, from Norway, from Algeria. Uh, we want to develop a fourth corridor to the Caspian Sea, and I hope we will over the next... Thing, we are working quite a lot behind the scenes uh, to make this happen, and I, I am personally optimistic that over the next six months we will see much more concrete results for the development of this uh, southern corridor. Uh, we, we need to address through that, and also, also to additional LNG imports, uh, the, the single source dependency which we have in particular in East European countries. Overall, our dependency from Russia is only 25%, but it's you know, as if you are between a, a hot plate and, and, and the fridge. Uh, the average doesn't, is not very meaningful in this respect. Uh, and uh, therefore, therefore uh, I think we need to, to create more sources of uh, diversification, in particular for Eastern Europe. Um, and we need to improve also network resilience. We need to increase more reverse flows uh, to bring the gas where it is needed in time of a crisis. 
in the January 2009 crisis, it happened exactly what we knew before. We had a very cold winter. You remember minus 15 degrees centigrade around. And we had our winter forecast, which we always do, where the TSOs told us that uh, by minus 10, uh, our gas networks will be full at 98%. And then 1st of January, cold winter, Russia cut the gas. We had a gas available in Holland, but we couldn't bring it down to the southeast because the network was completely full. So we have no redundancy in the network and the gas network. And, um, uh, and the companies, of course, say, why should we pay the money to have 20, 10 or 20 percent spare capacity in the network? This is not profitable for us. So you see that there is perhaps already the reason for some look at the pipelines and at the electricity interconnectors also, at least to a certain degree, as a public good where the public side needs to provide sufficient, uh, sufficient uh, financial incentives also that the investments are being done. We need also to look at CO2 infrastructure. This is perhaps not yet uh, the topic for this decade, but it's coming up and we need to look, we need to have a good connection between where the CO2 <coughs> Uh, is produced and where, where the sinks are, uh, we need to look into oil. We have never done this before, uh, not because we want to finance it, but we see that in particular in Eastern Europe, the oil network is very uh, fragmented and it does not allow also for energy security reasons to provide oil in sufficient quantities under all circumstances to, to those regions. Uh, just to give you also a background on uh, how, how the development, uh, particularly for the electricity side of renewables, will influ influence this development. You see that away from the classical hydro, uh, we will see a huge increase in wind energy, also quite a considerable decrease in biomass and uh, at least in percentage terms also in solar, but it's certainly wind which will be the dominant of the, the dominant development over the next years. Very briefly, uh, a little bit a highlight on how we see the gas consumption scenarios develop. Uh, depends whom you talk to. If you talk to those forecasters who believe that all our objectives with regard to renewables and energy efficiency will see the light of the day, then at least until 2020, 2030, gas demand will still be about the same. It may slightly decrease thereafter. Uh, it will remain the same because our domestic production in the EU of gas it will drastically decline, so we will need additional sources. That's why we want to have also the Southern Corridor. Uh, if you talk to the gas industry, they are much more bullish and they think that gas demand will also continue to increase thereafter. Uh, the same is a little bit true also for electricity production. Uh, a lot of people in the electricity industry think that electricity as a clean energy source uh, will will have a huge increase, and also you see that the forecasts here for uh, we haven't we have only made a forecast until 2030, where the forecasts don't differ so very much here. But then afterwards, it depends really which crystal ball you are looking into, and of course, industry is always much more optimistic about the development of its sector than perhaps others. Um, we have seen that there are a number of obstacles to infrastructure development. We see that we have huge uncertainties with regard to the long-term uh, demand scenarios. Uh, we do not know exactly, many member states do not know what the energy mix will look like. Uh, some member states want to go out of nuclear, but it's not totally clear whether they will, uh, or some people want to go further into nuclear. Um, uh, we have, uh, as I said, an imperfect internal market, which we need to remedy because I think the best uh, remedy for uh, energy security purposes is a functioning internal market where we can help each other out. This is really active practice solidarity. Um, we see that um, the tariff regulation and financing needs to be addressed. Um, we have um, sometimes problems uh, for the regulators and for the TSOs to have uh, to allocate the cost and benefits properly, in particular for transmission grids which cross a country and where the, country, the transmission country may see, well, it's not in our benefit, we are, at the, we are just transmitting the energy, we are not the one who are benefiting from it. Um, uh, in, if you use new technologies, uh, do the regulators foresee a sufficient high ra rate of return? Um, I have given you an example on that infrastructure sometimes is needed for security of supply reasons. Also, this needs to be, uh, be accepted as an element for the regulated asset base. 
and uh, today we see in the financial crisis that it is difficult to have access to financing. We need to talk about permitting and social acceptance. Um, this is uh, uh, quite important. Um, we, we need to address uh, the problem that a number of uh, projects are hung <coughs> for 15 years or so and no decision is taken. Uh, we want to streamline this permitting process, not through reducing the possibilities of the citizen to intervene in the process, but rather to have a really a, a processed uh, um, uh, follow-up. And I think you in Ireland, I learned, uh, you have a one-stop shop already here for infrastructure planning, which I think is perhaps a good example also for other countries. Uh, we need to look to the infrastructures beyond the EU, in particular for the gas side, and we think, we, we think that uh, today the 10E framework is pretty much insufficient uh, to, to address all these questions. We have presented a report in spring where we tried to give the lessons learned for the last uh, four years or so. Um, we have seen that many of the 10E projects which we have financed have moved significantly, significantly ahead, <coughs> but uh, a lot more needs to be done. Um, the 10E have to a certain degree contributed to integrate the internal market better, but there are a lot of bottlenecks still at the borders. Um, uh, we, need, uh, we see also that the budget which we have at the European level is limited. Now, we do not want to talk too much about budget today because we think it is more important to talk about the priorities first, talk about the solutions for the permitting, and then only when we discuss uh, next year and the year after about the new financial perspectives 2014-2020, a very important financial discussion will come up, then we should also address the question whether we need more money at the EU level to provide this additional delta where uh, the commercial aspects and the regulators alone cannot guarantee sufficient financing for some of the projects. Today we have only 20 million a year which is a drop in the ocean. Uh, it is just sufficient to finance some feasibility studies. In comparison for the 10 transport, we have 1 billion a year, so we can really make an impact, and we have done so for the speeding up of projects like the Brenner Base Tunnel or for railways or certain railway high lines, high, highways. So this, this, is, this is a big difference. Uh, when I was responsible as a director also for the Trans-European Network transport side, and when we discussed the guidelines and the budget uh, uh, last time, several years ago, uh, people said in Parliament and in the Council we should, we should delete the financing for energy totally altogether because the companies can do it. They are rich. They, they can do it all on their own. You see, this was only four or five years ago, and we see today that this is not the case, that we need to have a different pump priming approach also for some of the energy projects, and that without... Uh, public steering and without priority setting at the top level, uh, the, the companies alone will not be able to, to do what they, what they need to do. But a lot of the investment, of course, needs to be financed. It's, I do not want to give the impression here that we want to have a, a budget to finance the 1,000 billion euros of investment I talked to in the beginning. No, no. The, the majority needs to be financed by the companies and must be done by the companies, and rightly so. But I think there are some inter incremental cases where we need an additional uh, uh, effort uh, from the from the EU budget. Um, we have, in the meantime, had one experience with with uh, infrastructure financing through the European Recovery Program, where we also, I think, finance 100 million for the electricity interconnector between Great Britain and Ireland. Um, where we have some 50 projects uh, which we financed. The motivation, of course, was in a question of the economic cycle to, to uh, get more investment also in the energy sector, but it will have lots of structural effects on the energy sector. Um, we had uh, very good proposals, uh, we have, and, uh, which has confirmed to us by the European Investment Bank our financing has accelerated the realization of these investments considerably, so the leverage effect has been there. Uh, and we have encouraged also a lot of cross-border cooperation uh, in electricity and in gas. We have uh, now a lot more reverse flow possibilities for gas, for example, so it has had an impact uh, on the market. Uh, these are just a few examples. I have not enough time to go into that, so I will rush over that and go to the to the next one. Um, 
So the new European Energy Security and Infrastructure Instrument, which will be presented next week, in our opinion, should, uh, bet, should get a better priority focus. We think that we have now today about 500 eligible projects uh, in the European, in the 10E program. We think that list is much too, too big. We, we think we should concentrate on big corridors and then leave it up to the member states to define the individual project that will provide much more flexibility. We should enhance regional cooperation, as I said. Uh, we should uh, also address the question of public acceptance and the permitting procedure. Uh, we would want uh, to um, have, um, we would want to have uh, perhaps uh, also a rule that we will only finance projects where the permitting is going fastly, uh, faster, uh, faster ahead. So if if we offer money, then the member state should in return also guarantee that the project uh, goes on. It's no use to commit European money and then afterwards we, we'd never use it because the project doesn't achieve a mature phase in the permitting. All this will be discussed. Uh, we hope that we will get the support of the member states uh, through, the, through the heads of state next February. Here are some of the priorities which we think we should concentrate on. Uh, for the electricity grid, uh, it's clear it's linking the offshore grid, uh, the offshore production to the to the grid in the North Sea. We need to improve the interconnections southwest. Uh, in the southwest, uh, we need uh, better connection in central east and southeast, and we need to uh, link the Baltic market, which is very isolated, uh, to the heartland of Europe. Uh, for gas, uh, the Southern Corridor is one of our top priorities, as I mentioned. Again, we need to link the Baltic uh, gas grids uh, to Europe. Uh, we, need, we have now uh, mainly two big lines or a bunch of bunches of big lines coming from Russia, East, West, the Yamal and the Brotherhood pipeline systems. Uh, we, need, we, have, uh, have, we have run models see, uh, looking into what happens if one of those trunk lines is cut and we see that we have insufficient cross-border uh, uh, linkages between them. So we need uh, north-south uh, interconnections in the gas side. And we need also uh, a north-south corridor in Western Europe from Spain up to France and further to the north. Uh, we need to look into the oil supply situation in some of the East European countries, and we need to find a way to stimulate the rollout of smart grid technologies. And then in the longer run, it's the question of those electricity highways I talked earlier about uh, and of a CO2 transport network. Uh, that is the time for the next decade. Um, let me just briefly also say a few, uh, a few words on the transparent permitting procedures we are thinking of. We want to have what you have in Ireland already, a one-stop approach, uh, where we have a national coordinating authority who will guarantee that, the, that it's, again, that the processes are done in a, in a speedy way. Um, I, I, I'd rather have a negative decision after five years than a no decision for 15 years, because then you can do a new planning and attack something new. But, uh, I think we need to, to have uh, an authority which is really responsible for, for bringing the process along. Uh, we would want to, pro to have a maximum time limit for the final decision to be taken. Uh, the, there is a, I think even the, the energy ministers last year said that it should be, could be five years, so we will see how they react to this now. Uh, we want to have an early involvement of stakeholders I think in particular the examples from the transport sector, the discussion we have in Germany on this uh, Stuttgart 21, the Stuttgart 21 uh, train station shows that uh, a lot of damage can be done if you simply steam ahead without bringing the citizens along from an early stage. So we need to make to guarantee that the stakeholders are properly consulted and involved. Um, we need also perhaps to think about compensation to, to provide to those authorities or regions who are not directly benefiting from the infrastructure. Um, I, I, I always uh, uh, tell the examples of a discussion which I had with a French deputy of parliament, a uh, member of parliament there, coming from northern Normandy, who, whom I asked, how, how, why do you have no negative re re reaction in your, in your, from your citizens 
against all your nuclear processing plant and nuclear power plant, and you're going to build a new one there, and everybody is in favor. And he said, yes, because we are making good money out of it. Uh, we, we, are, we, are, we have become rich with this. Uh, we get a lot of uh, payments there. We have better schools than in the past. We have more jobs, etc. cetera. Uh, we have at the same time all this uh, not in my backyard problem with regard to other uh, energy infrastructure in Europe, uh, be it electricity, high voltage lines, or, or CO2 storage sites, where people say, why should we suffer this uh, we have if we are not directly benefiting from it? So I think you need to, to come to a, to, we need to find a, a better a way to, to, to make people benefit. Um, and we, I think, as I said, we need to link the, I think we need to link the, the payment of European funding uh, to the progress in, in these decisions. And this is really the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.